All right. Well, um, great to be with everybody. I know that Eric has got some Bible readings and a, a bit of context to set up for us. Why don't I open us with a word of prayer? Oh God, we thank you so much for gathering your people together. We thank you for our church family and for this opportunity to dive deeper into your scriptures, um, into your story in a unique way. Help us to be focused, oh God, over these next 90 minutes uh, on your word and help us to learn and grow in our faith together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so this week, I believe I might actually get to see the Sermon on the Mount, but we'll see. <laughs> A we, lot of buildup last time. Yeah, so I, because the readings actually um, involve the Sermon on the Mount. So I don't know if we are going to read all of it because it basically says read Matthew chapters five through seven. Yep, that's the Sermon on the Mount. That's so, um, the one. So, um, having said that, we could probably read a few sections. I'd be happy to kind of walk through the Sermon on the Mount a little bit. Would that be okay? That would be perfect. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, very good. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> we are pretty well familiar with the Beatitudes, I think. Um, and the, one of the cool things about our last episode, and that was why I thought we were just finishing. I, think, I thought they were going to be finishing with the Sermon on the Mount, not just getting ready and then, up oh, season's over. But um, <laughs> I guess they know how the to cliffhanger. pull us, <laughs> keep us pulled in for the next uh, the next season. But um, the Sermon on the Mount is, uh, is just amazing. Of course, we talked a little bit last time about the uh, Mount of Beatitudes next to the Sea of Galilee. And um, when we were doing our, our tour of the Holy Land, our staycation through the Holy Land, I joked, no wonder Jesus did most of his preaching and teaching and hanging out uh, around the Sea of Galilee. It's absolutely beautiful. And um, while we probably have a snapshot in our mind about what we consider the Holy Land to look like, rather arid and uh, hilly, but dry and you know that kind of thing, um, the area around the Sea of Galilee is lush and beautiful. There's palm trees and big giant flower bushes everywhere. and uh, so that's kind of the setting, at least as it is now, in the place where the Chapel of the Beatitudes is constructed next to the Sea of Galilee now. Um, that one. So we'll kind of keep that in mind. So that's kind of the setting in the backdrop. Um, we have a very short introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain and he sat down. Here in The Chosen, it looks like he sort of gets up on stage. <laughs> Unless I saw at least he movie. comes out of the curtains. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Like a talk show guest. But he um, sits down and he begins to speak. Now, what's also interesting about the Sermon on the Mount is that if we look at verses one and two, then uh, let's see here. He went up the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, it kind of sounds like he's just talking to the disciples, unless I'm reading that wrong. Yeah. Um, which is interesting because we all have in our imagination that Jesus is speaking to a, a multitude here. Um, but the takeaway from that, I think, is that Jesus <laughs> trusts those who have his teaching to spread the word. And he, the, the crowd may have been so large that he is relying on the disciples to uh, teach, um, maybe not all at once, but kind of in groups. So um, we all know about the Beatitudes. That's awesome. Typically, when we read this in our lectionary, we also tag on um, 14, uh, 13 through 16, the well, salt of the earth and the light of the world. I'm thinking of um, 
Matthew and Jesus having their conversation in last week's episode. And he says, well, if people mishear you, they'll think you're saying salty earth. And they'll think that you mean like bad luck, like the Romans did to Carthage. And um, which I thought was pretty great. <clears throat> so, but, and then, you know, the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, I don't know if it gets quite as much um, laud and honor as that first bit with the Beatitudes, but it is three entire chapters long, and uh, there's all sorts of stuff in there. Um, for example, no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and the word is mammon, but it's translated here as well. Hello. I apologize, but I do have four new tires. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> little unexpected expense. Oh, uh, little tired. Hi, everybody. Really Sorry. Unless I had a state inspection or something good, huh? No. Um, so you can't serve God and wealth. That is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Mount. Um, I'm looking in uh, chapter seven, just because we don't focus on it as much in our regular lectionary. And so we also have um, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Uh, there's a lot of great hymns written around <clears throat> that part of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is the law and prophets. That's a pretty, pretty bold statement. Um, we also hear in the Sermon on the Mount things like, do not judge unless you would be judged. Um, I wish we focused a little bit more on that probably in the <laughs> church, but <clears throat> be that as it may. Um, and then some really great metaphors that <clears throat> after 2,000 years of thinking and debating I don't know if we still know what they mean. Don't throw your pearls before swine, for example. Um, I've heard a whole lot of interpretations of that. None of them exactly scratch the itch, but um, there, there, there's a lot in here. So it's kind of funny that they ask us to read all three chapters, but maybe it's worth it to just say the Sermon on the Mount is more than the Beatitudes. It's even more than the Beatitudes, the salt and the light. Um, there's a lot of really great stuff in there. Um, I think probably my favorite part of the Sermon on the Mount takes place in chapter six, starting at verse 25. The, Jesus says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Yeah. So <clears throat> it's just beautiful and comforting. Um, <clears throat> that's probably enough before we see okay. the interpretation of that. Were there any uh, comments or anything like that? I do think that we need to spend more time talking about um, not judging. I think that was probably one of the biggest things in my faith development that when I finally quit seeing things black and white and judging, um, that I, I grew immensely from that. <clears throat> yeah, and for some reason, judging comes so easily to us. And um, it's more fun. <laughs> than being nice to everyone. No, it's just, it seem, it's kind of taken over and we let it take over our, our consciousness instead of um, diving deeper into a person's life, we just would rather judge and walk away. And that's really or, true. Or even in, in my case, I've decided that it's not my place to judge. It's God's place to judge. So why am I even spending my time thinking that I have any reason that I should be doing that? Because that's that's for my Lord to do, not me. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, well said. And uh, speaking of metaphors, the, the one in the Sermon on the Mount is great. It's the beginning of chapter 7. And Jesus says, you hypocrites, <clears throat> which is also the word for actor, which is kind of interesting. Um, but he says, you hypocrites, how can you see the speck in someone else's eye and not notice the log that's in your own or the branch that's in your own? Um, and I don't think anybody gets away from that one scot-free, that we're all guilty of that. Mm -hmm. well, I really like the way in the message um, when uh, Jesus is wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount and um, the translation of the message is, but if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you're like a stupid carpenter who built his house on a sandy beach. When the storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. <laughs> I am not going to ask you why you connected with these. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to. Uh, yeah, well, very good. Yep. Um, so the other the other scripture passage that they have in the um, in the study guide is, and I'm not I'm not sure that I didn't think we would get that far if we're going to do the Sermon on the Mount, but it's um, Luke four and they say just verses four eighteen, but you got to read a little further to get a, a little bit of background. Um, and this is when Jesus was rejected in Nazareth. So Jesus returned to Galilee and the power of the spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. And he stood up to read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. On rolling it, he found the place where it is written. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And of course, the uh, the other reading that they had in there was Isaiah 61.1, which was that um, 418 verse back in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Does it say the exact same thing? Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor? Um. Yeah. So this, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion. Ah, comfort those who mourn. There's definitely a Beatitudes connection there mm. too. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. <clears throat> Do we interpret the year of the Lord's favor as the year of Jubilee? Is that the same thing? Hmm. Say that again, Ben. Um, I was just wondering if we interpret the year of the Lord's favor which is in Isaiah 61 and uh, then uh, read by Jesus out loud in Luke chapter four, um, the year of the Lord's favor. And I'm wondering if that's the same thing as the idea of the year of Jubilee, which is every seventh year, um, slaves are freed and debts are forgiven. And um, yeah, I think you let the land lie fallow it's kind of a reset year. And I, I didn't know if the year of the Lord's favor was the same thing. So, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because people ask, what did Jesus mean by the year of the Lord's favor? Is the year of the Lord's favor the year of Jubilee? And therefore at Nazareth, Jesus was proclaiming a Jubilee year. Oh. The expression of Isaiah 61-2 year clearly refers to the prescriptions in the book of Le Leviticus on the Jubilee year. And that's from the Vatican. So it's got to be right. 
I had a feel I, just that time increment, I guess, stands out as interesting. The year, um, of course, the Hebrews don't keep the same 365 day year that we do. But um, I think that's why that popped into my head. So if it is a year of Jubilee <clears throat> that Jesus is referencing, then he is talking about letting the oppressed go free, which would be a, a really important theme for Jews who are being occupied by Romans. Yeah, it said the year of Jubilee marked a time when all debts were forgiven for God's people. Mm -hmm. And Jesus fell at that the time. Text, there's a... Ah, yeah, yeah. Well, in the next person, the next time somebody he hears somebody say, um, "We look. This is a Christian nation. Just make sure that every seventh year they're forgiving their debts." <laughs> you have to be a mortgage banker. Uh, yeah. You, you just have, have to write seven-year mortgages. That's right. <laughs> Horrendous interest rates. Yeah. Uh, Six and a half year. I think it was really, yes, the year of the Lord's favor is the same as Jubilee year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got confirmation so, from the internet. So say it's Google. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, um, that may be central. It, it might not be, but the, uh, as we unravel the scriptures, we always find deeper meanings. And if we're talking Jubilee, it's got all all of that stuff with it. Um, it's the kind of thing that probably the ancient Jews weren't able to really follow under Roman rule. The, the economy just didn't work that way. But um, the promise of forgiving debts and of freeing the oppressed would be a really important message for an occupied people. So, okay. Other thoughts? I just have to get the Romans to recognize the year of the Lord. Yeah, come on. It's only yeah. going to take 360 years. I don't, I'm not even sure if, uh, if good old Constantine was, um, you know, that, that good at following that portion of. <laughs> you would have been awful at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Well, um, <clears throat> going to try to remember what the order is here if I share first and then pull it up. All right, everybody. We've got a little bit of time to um, debrief and um, <clears throat> anything in that episode that just struck you so much that you want to shout it from the mountaintops. You know, after after all of the buildup for the big sermon on the mount. Man, I, I felt let down. Mm. I mean, it was it was just a little brief little snippets. I mean, kind of like what we just did, skimming through the the three chapters of Matthew. Yeah, <clears throat> Sermon on the Mount montage is not the same. <laughs> Cliff notes. <laughs> Hit some high points though, for sure. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> Don't worry about your body. Don't worry about your life. And even he even closed with the part about the carpenter. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy, yeah. Yeah. He, he just he just said a, a smart man or not <laughs> rather than a carpenter. But of course, it wasn't the things he said were were strong, but what was important was what happened to the people who heard it. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, what kind of things did we see happening to people who heard that that sermon? Well, the centurion was speechless. I like that. Uh, the spy enjoyed the centurion being speechless. <laughs> but um, the um, you know Judas. It's amazing the way they show Judas feeling being called by God. And did, biblically, did they say that's when he was introduced to Jesus, was Sermon on the Mount? No, no there's very, very little talk of Judas until closer to the end. <laughs> He's uh, mentioned in a list. And he's always the, he's always last, you know. These eleven, and then Judas, who betrayed him. Very, very little about um, the way that he followed Jesus, or certainly when, and uh, any details about his call. His last name is mentioned. Yeah. I, I that was In that the, was the line to me that was the best in the episode was. Judas, you got to take care of yourself. You're the last in our line. Our name will be forgotten when you're gone. <laughs> and uh, no, his name will never be forgotten. <laughs> no. Just maybe not in the way that his parents may have imagined. No, no. Yeah. His, his sister's saying it would have been much easier if you just had a son to, to carry on the family name rather than having to go out to this unknown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, and um, <clears throat> kind of cool little details. He's introduced as Judas of Kiriot in Scripture. <clears throat> well, I don't know about originally, but we in our Scriptures it says Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, but that would mean his father is from that place. So <clears throat> cool little little wording things there. Um, <clears throat> and very common for that time to, for people to be, no, instead of having a true last name, be kind of, well, Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. I, think I like how this episode um, brought out this humanity and the, and the um, uh, connectivity of, of the disciples. Um, how Andrew had formed the bond with with John, and then um, seeming John understood what Jesus was going to preach on the mount, and he asked him, "Well, what did what did you um, uh, hear when Jesus? What were Jesus' words that touched you?" and uh, the bit about his anxiety and how he can't add another hour to a day um, with that kind of a behavior. Um, but then they all seem to um, just be filled with more love and understanding and, and um, the Holy Spirit and how they started interacting with each other afterwards more than the fighting and the, or the the back and forth that they were doing uh previously peter seemed to be filled with something else uh -oh. <laughs> <clears throat> well when you haven't seen your wife for months you know. <laughs> um and then being interrupted by everybody Right. I loved how his brother said, you look like you want to take a stone and mash my head in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then as soon as they're, he's about to walk out, Simon the Zealot shows up. Yeah. But um, yeah, we see all kind of reactions, but I was struck by that too, Lynn, about um, just that vision of them around in a circle afterward, almost like a huddle. Um, he, he brings everyone, gathers around, and they kind of, oh, thanks to them for the work they did. Yay. Welcome, Judas. Yay. And um, the applause for Jesus, who, of course, is humble. <clears throat> but 
to see them as a group all together without others there was pretty powerful too and just the overwhelming good feeling that they had from the sermon going so well and i think the thing in that scene that really affected me was the fact that you know um grace is pretty good about holding hands or putting arms around each other pandemic really kind of made us back off from each other but i mean we at passing the peace, we used to just walk up to each other and give hugs. Right. And I, I don't think going forward that's a good idea just because we're all old and we're going to get all these illnesses that go around. But um, I can say like on a, a Via de Cristo weekend or in, in the Oates family, when we, we have so many who are not attending church at all, but when we get together, we gather up and hold hands for um, a thanksgiving of whoever wants to give a prayer or if they want to just say, you know, mm -hmm. we're grateful or to the almighty power or whatever. But, you know, that whole thing about gathering and holding and touching was so important to me. And and uh, and so that really affected me in the, in the movie itself. Yeah. I noticed on Sunday... Um, that some of them uh, during the last song were holding hands in the back. Uh, I think it was Tim Hess that reached out his hand and or and were holding hands. And yes, we used to do that all the time. And that's another thing that's a product of the pandemic. Well, I need to leave some of that behind. Maybe not all of it, but I think we need to leave some of it behind. Yeah, but <clears throat> to me, it speaks to a truly sacramental faith or a sacramental relationship mm -hmm. <clears throat> for the people who think about it all the time. That was the worst part of COVID was trying to balance a sacramental faith, which is, which is that visceral touch and being in the presence of and breathing the same air as each other and God. And... Um, trying to square that with also being safe and trying to be citizens of the world, not just sharing disease freely. That, that was really, really hard. But that is to me a sacramental activity where people are holding hands, touching, hugging, whatever it might be. That's, that's the power of the sacraments. It's, it's God that you can feel with your, with your hands, with whatever. So as I grew up at Good Shepherd Episcopal Church with my folks, um, they always had a common cup. And mom, my mom was part of the altar guild for as long as she could do it. And, you know, when it came to flu season or whatever, um, she had this thing about being on the altar guild. And she said, if we're going to be actually sharing the sacrament, God will not make us sick over sick sharing a common chalice. And so they did not do um, anything but common cup. And I think to this day you can do intinction, but they don't have individual cups like we do, which is like, okay, mom, your faith is so strong that you go, no, if you're going to go up there and do communion, you don't have to worry about getting sick. Did they do like our church and or um, the church I went to and they put a little extra bourbon or something in there to, you know, kill a few more germs? Oh, I mean, that, that wine was a heck of a lot more fortified during the cold Ooh. flu season. Wow. <laughs> Never heard of that, but all right. There you go. Well, now we know what we're going to do at Grace. There you go. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um. <clears throat> The other thing that I really struck me was that, you know, when Andrew ended up actually going in and seeing John, did that really happen biblically? I don't think so. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, no, I, no, I didn't know it was written. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not a scholar, so I just thought, well, that was really interesting, you know, that Andrew got his boost. Mm -hmm. But the but the but the lady who who got him in, Joanna, is, is does she appear later as um supporting P, um, Paul or, or anybody. Hey, doesn't she appear later after the 
crucifixion where she goes with Mary to the tomb? Isn't she one of the women listed? In one of the Mary? Gospels, she is listed as a woman who went to the tomb. So, yeah. she, so she was involved in, in supporting them. Yeah, and again, in one of the Gospels, it mentions that there were a group of women who helped to fund the, the mission, and I think she was listed there too. But the connection with Herod's court and bringing Andrew and that, that's non-biblical. Right. I was wondering... Well, her husband was one of Herod's advisors or one of his people. That was that was listed in in the scripture, isn't it? She was a wife of some guy named what, Chop it or something, some name like that, Ellen. I don't remember the name, but I think she was listed as the wife of one of Herod's officials. Yes. Yeah. You have to look it up. Is it okay? Yeah, I didn't I didn't remember that, but could well be we've got somebody looking it up here. Um. But that is a really important detail i think that gets left out a lot we there's so much about the disciples um, but it explicitly the gospel explicitly says that there's a group of women who provided for the disciples in their mission and jesus there always is there always is yeah so you know when they talked about joanna and she had the the fiber, the shell, whatever it was, but it was purple. And um, my family comes back from a background of fiber people. And, you know, Lydia had the blue, which was very, very coveted and very expensive. And so Joanna had the purple, which is like, you know, the first offering that she gave in terms of, of a, a valuable piece of cloth. That was that was the most valued dye you could have back then, I think. Lydia was purple. blue. Well, purple, purple was. Purple was. Purple came from a mollusk that you would collect it and make it angry, and it would squirt out ink just like a squid, and that and that's what it squirted out was the basis of the uh, purple color. My I think textile made it good for you. I believe in this series we've seen Joanna before. If you remember on the um, coming in when Jesus came into on the Sunday where he rode the donkey and people were laying down branches, Palm Sunday. I think Joanna appeared in the Palm Sunday film. We don't. They not. They haven't seen that. Oh, I don't oh think. I'm sorry. yeah, we haven't. We haven't seen that. Yeah. Yeah. But we saw her. You're ahead of us. John. We mm -hmm. saw this John in the prison for sure. So, so I've seen her before, but I because I've seen all the way through four we'll series. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll see her again. Okay, so here is here's the answer from Got Questions, your questions, biblical answers. <laughs> Who is Joanna in the Bible? Joanna was one of several women in the Bible healed of evil spirits by Jesus Christ, Luke 8, 2. After being healed, Joanna accompanied Jesus and the 12 disciples on their travels from town to town and helped support the Lord's ministry. The wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod Antipas's household estate, Joanna was a woman of means and influence. <laughs> Susanna and others, Joanna helped provide food and supplies for the missionary troop from her own wealth. Luke 8, 1 to 3. Yeah, so you guys were right. Um, she is wife, according to Luke chapter 4, four 8, Luke chapter 8, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa. Right. Yeah, that's so, close. <laughs> yeah, so good. That was close. Good work. Good work. Um, okay, and so she that was did you, at the tomb. Did you guys pick up? on who the uh, uh, Pharisee was who was writing a letter to Nicodemus? I thought he was one of the ones that wanted to get Jesus in trouble. Was he was to start with, for sure. He was to start with. But he, yeah. was there, he was also there at the Sermon on the Mount, right? Yeah, right. His name is Joseph. Yusuf. Oh, yeah, Yusuf. Yeah, yeah, Yusuf. Yusuf. Yeah, yeah. Yusuf. Well, we, we know him as Joseph. Yusuf. Right. <laughs> 
So, um, yeah, so very good. I'm glad we did a little bit of digging there. Um, and so there are some other reactions too. I, I'm glad that Philip mustered the courage to ask if he could go see that young lady. Not Philip, Thomas. 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 Yeah. To, and it went well. After breakfast. <laughs> yeah. We love that they were that they were cheering for him. But yeah. Then... Mark Barnaby was like, "Yes, go." <laughs> <laughs> Mm hmm. Um, and as it relates to Joanna and Herod's court, I was wondering if they were going to tie. Um, because we don't hear very much about John in prison. Except that he sent uh, his followers to ask Jesus, are you the one? I thought that Andrew would find John the Baptist rather put out and down and worried. And uh, that he might send Andrew to ask Jesus, are you the one or are we to wait for another? But um, Andrew. didn't get there. But wasn't Andrew one of John's followers? Yes. And he was present when Jesus was baptized. Yes, he was one of John's. He was one of the ones that uh, that John sent. He said he sent two, two of his disciples to, to follow Jesus. See, there goes the there goes the Lamb so, of God. So Andrew went and told Peter mm -hmm. that we found the Messiah. So mm -hmm. I think, and I got the impression Andrew was one of John's followers, and probably was there when Jesus was baptized. So he was a witness to that. And Philip was. Philip and and, and Andrew were the two. I think. No, I thought it was John and Andrew, or John's no, disciples. No. And which two was it, Pastor? Andrew and who else? <laughs> Philip was the one sitting under the tree. And usually we think about John and James and because they're brothers. And they were fishermen. Yeah, and they were they were fishermen. Yeah, John 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 was wasn't given too much um uh, too much um uh anyway he was Kudos in this, in, in this episode, attention. he was uh, all as I can think about is cinnamon buns and my mom's. <laughs> uh, as James, that was James, big James. Okay, that was big, big James. James. That was big, big James. James. Okay. Big James, right? And and uh, and his brother was going. You don't. You 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 you're not thinking about the sermons any No, I'm just the miracles. I'm just thinking about. Emos, Moms cinnamon. cooking. Ooh, choir story. Yeah, I was gonna say we got to get. Um, we got to oh. be done. Sorry, uh, we're gonna run to choir. But um, yeah, and then what a bummer to hear that his mom had run out of cinnamon. For <laughs> 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 all that. All right. Well, hey, um, thanks so much, everybody. We're gonna run over to choir here, but um, we'll be gathered again next week, same bat time, same bat channel. All righty. All right. Thank you. Good night.